Thank you. Thank you for having me and uh, thank you for the, the nice introduction. Um, my name is Barb Turpin and I'm with the um, OGKC, Ohio Grandparent Kinship Coalition. And uh, I want to thank Kara and Bobby and uh, the group for inviting me to provide information about uh, kinship caregivers. Um, I think uh, it's a, a very important uh, topic, uh, especially now with a lot of the caregivers being involved with uh, uh, taking on the responsibility of caring for their um, children. So I'm going to try to do get my PowerPoint up here. Uh, share. Okay. Um, I, again, am uh, very appreciative of the invitation to present information about kinship care. And within the time frame that I have, I'm going to try to um, do something that will help you connect with kinship caregivers. Um, I am familiar with the Family and Children First Councils and Treatment of Molly System Youth from my work in foster care adoption and kinship care policy at the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services and prior to that at the Department of Youth Services. Before I get started into uh, the formal presentation, I would like to read an email that was sent uh, this morning at 1.53 a.m. Uh, this is almost like a phone call that you receive in the middle of the night from someone who, who is in crisis and desperate for help. Um, hello, I'm looking for anybody to help me. I have been approved by kinship to take my grandchildren, but the caseworker will not let them. She is racist beyond belief, and her reason is because she doesn't want to. I'm very scared because I have video of the extreme danger that I'm in. I'm scared for their safety. I'm wondering if I should take these videos to social media. Um, this is not necessarily unusual. Uh, I, I am uh, in receipt of emails almost weekly about uh, people who are in a crisis situation, uh, either have taken their children in or in the process of taking their children in. And so uh, this is a very real situation. I've been involved with kinship caregivers for over 25 years and I'm currently uh, with OGKC, which is a nonprofit, all volunteers statewide advocacy organization for kinship families. I was thinking about how to best make the use of the time I have to give you insight into the lives of caregivers. So I am going to cover a few slides of the PowerPoint, but since they're going to be provided to you, I'm not going to th go through all of them because some of them uh, right now, I think can be best left for you to look at um, at your leisure. Um, so in addition to the slides, I'm going to tell you about a kinship caregiver situation who I've been working with for the last couple of weeks. Um, and uh, he contacted me in March. So let me go ahead and go to the first slide. And it, it's pretty much a description of what kinship care is. It has been around for centuries. It's, it's not really new. Most cultures uh, have done kinship care and before it ever had a name. And a, even now, a lot of families don't know that they are actually kinship families, but they know that what they're doing is right and, um, it's, and they feel that it is the right thing to do. Kinship care is uh, raising children by not only grandparents, other extended family members, adults whom uh, the children have close family-like relationships with, such as godparents and close family friends, um, due to the biological parents not being able to uh, care for the children, either for a short term or in the long term. Legal custody of a child may or may not be involved, and the child may be related by blood, marriage, or adoption, or maybe not even related at all. Studies have shown that kinship care is the best placement option for children by key, keeping them out of the child welfare system and achieving permanency and stability in their lives. It's for this reason that supporting the needs of kinship families is so important. The next slide describes uh, the types of kinship care. Uh, informal kinship care is when a child is placed with a kinship caregiver with no court or child welfare agency involvement and custody is not necessary. Um, 
There is also a, a grand power of a, grandparent power of attorney, which is only for the use by grandparents. And this uh, power of attorney is authorized by the parents uh, in order for the child, for the grandparent to be able to enroll the child in school and obtain medical care. Uh, the power of attorney is filed with the court for a year. It's a notarized document and the parent can revoke it at any time by going back through the court. There's another document, uh, caregiver authorization, and is specific to grandparents only. It's when the grandparent doesn't know the whereabouts of the parent and they can have this notarized, filed with court in order to be able to enroll the child in school and um, obtain medical care. The formal form of uh, kinship care is when a kinship caregiver files for custody and is granted custody of the child by the court in order for the child to go back to the parent if the parent decides that they are uh, ready for that child to come back the court must approve that return of the child to the parent and in order to do that there has to be significant proof that the, the parent is in a position to assume a responsibility for that child again uh, the second formal uh, type of care is a child welfare agency takes the child from the parents, assumes custody and places the child with an approved relative. The agency may return the child to the parent or ultimately petition the court to award custody to the caregiver, at which time the agency closes the case, then the court must approve return of the child to the parent as well. And then uh, the third type of formal care is a licensed foster parent where the kinship caregiver can become a licensed foster parent through the child welfare agency. Uh, the caregiver must complete all of the requirements to become licensed, just the same as foster parent. And for obvious reasons, this is not uh, the choice of, of most caregivers. They really don't wanna be involved with the child welfare system. Uh, they don't want to meet uh, the requirements, not only uh, the immediate requirements for licensure, but ongoing training requirements for licensure. So, the majority of uh, kinship caregivers don't become licensed as foster parents, but those who do are then become eligible to receive the foster care maintenance payment, which is uh, significantly higher than the um, traditional supports that kinship caregivers uh, receive. And I'm gonna skip some of these because again, I think you can read these uh, later and uh, gain a little bit of additional information on what's going on with kinship care on a national basis. This slide uh, identifies the caregivers' needs uh, that are important to them and that they've identified as crucial to maintaining a um, healthy and safe household for children. And as you can see, financial support is number one, then it goes down to medical support, child care, uh, legal services, access to appropriate mental health services, counseling, educational services, uh, recreational activities. This is something that people don't think much about, but when the kids are out of uh, school for summer vacation, school breaks, um, just uh, not being in school, then there's a need for them to be involved with recreational activities. And a lot of the caregivers are older, and so it's, it's more difficult for them to be involved with the children. So they are looking for outside activities to keep the kids out of trouble and active. Respite care is another need that, that sometimes they just need a break and uh, need to you know, get uh, a time to focus on themselves. Affordable housing, um, food stamp eligibility, and free and reduced price lunch eligibility, as well as childcare are all based on kinship uh, caregivers' income. So a lot of those caregivers who either work or are retired on a retired income don't meet eligibility to receive these, and that creates a big hardship. Support groups are another uh, significant um, service provision to caregivers to be able to sit and talk with others that are going through education or the same types of situations. And then secondary education funding, again, is not something that uh, people think about much, but uh, a child wanting to go to college, where are the resources, where are the financial support? Uh, these are things that caregivers really have a hard time accessing. And um, the last uh, slide is about um, resources. And I think this is something that you can follow up on. 
there are resources here that will help you get a better understanding of, of uh, kinship care as well as resources for kinship caregivers if you're working with caregivers specifically. Um, our uh, uh, website address is uh, there at the bottom and we have a, a significant amount of resources on our website also. I wanna just go back and I'll leave this uh, kinship facts slide up while I'm talking uh, about the story about the caregiver that I've been involved with. So you can maybe read through this while I'm talking. Um, I want to tell you about the gentleman that I've been involved with since about the 1st of, of March. Uh, his name is Anthony and he um, contacted OGKC because he had taken legal custody of his nephew who was an age 12 and his niece who was age 11, two years ago after their great grandmother who was his grandmother and she had legal custody of them. She died um, two years ago. So Anthony decided to uh, become the legal guardian of the children. He is also disabled and receives SSI, which is about $800 a month for him. There are no other relatives available or willing to take the children or provide support to Anthony and the children. He moved into the house that belonged to the grandmother and where the children lived with her. So he didn't want to disrupt their lives anymore. And that allowed them to continue going to attending the schools and um, being part of the community where they had grown up. Anthony receives about $417 a month in cash assistance for the children and $350 in food stamps. He also sees the medical coverage for the children. The Ohio Works First cash assistance payment and medical coverage do not uh, require the caregiver's income to be counted for eligibility, but the food stamps and childcare eligibility are based on the caregiver's income which makes most families ineligible for these critical supports. At the beginning of March and without any prior notice, Anthony was informed that the house he had been living in with the two children had been sold at probate and he would have to vacate by March 31st. When he contacted OGKC, he was two weeks away from being homeless with the children. His car needed repair and he did not know where to turn to get help. He contacted the Ohio Kinship Adoption Navigator Program for assistance, and they referred him to several social services agencies and OGKC. Since OGKC is not a social service organization and doesn't have financial resources to provide direct support to families, but we do connect families with resources and help them navigate systems. We found that low-income housing has at least a two-year waiting list, and he has no savings to put a deposit on an apartment. He can apply for prevention, retention, and contingency funds, which is through uh, the Ohio Department or the Franklin County Department of Job and Family Services. And these are one-time payments that can be used to help prevent children from being placed into foster care. He was. Um, attempting to apply for this to get his car fixed, but because his car is not running, he doesn't have transportation to get to that, um, this uh, support agency or some of the other social services agencies that he was referred to to apply for services. He and the children eventually had to move out of the house and were unable to get into a, a shelter immediately. So he was able to move into a friend's house temporarily. Anthony was stressed out trying to keep the family together and finding housing. I was able to meet face-to-face -face with Anthony and provide him with some gift cards that had been donated to OGKC. I also was able to meet his 12-year-old uh, nephew who was coming home from school at the time. Anthony told his nephew that the school had contacted him to tell him that his nephew was doing well in school. But what I observed about his nephew in that few minutes that I had to, uh, in meeting him was that he seemed depressed and he showed little emotion when Anthony told him about the good news. I think that these children could be multi-system youth who are in need of intervention and treatment for ACEs and trauma. The Kinship Navigator was able to provide Anthony with rent assistance so he could move into an apartment 
for which he was in the process of completing the paperwork and hopefully going to be able to move in too soon. It is in the same neighborhood so that the children can continue to go to the same school and community. I hear similar stories from caregivers who are overwhelmed and struggling to make ends meet and deal with the emotional issues of the children because they were not prepared to take in children who had already been traumatized prior to coming to them. They are on a fixed income or they're being evicted because uh, taking children into housing that doesn't accommodate additional people causes them to lose their uh, place of uh, current living. Losing or quitting their jobs because they can't afford childcare, trying to help the parents get the help they need to be able to take the children back or fighting for custody because the parents aren't able to care for their children. Not able to find services for the children, fighting to get help for the children in school, needing respite, needing activities for the children, and the caregiver ends up not prioritizing their own needs and help for their trauma and feelings of guilt. Anthony, like many caregivers, is supporting his family on $1,500 a month. Foster care providers receive, at a minimum, $624 to a maximum of $2,600 a month per child. This is in addition to their personal income, other support services, and administrative costs for the Child Welfare Agency. So caregivers like Anthony are saving the counties a tremendous amount of money. I hope this gives you some insight into what kinship caregivers and the children in their care struggle with daily and how Project ECHO and multi-system youth can provide help and support to these families. But also know that research shows that kinship care is the best place to be for children who can't be with their parents. Thank you for the role you play in providing a lifeline to many of these children. And with that, I have completed my presentation and I don't know if there's time for questions, but would be pleased to answer any questions.